Many of you have probably heard some odd or dumb quotes in your life. For example, have you ever heard the quote that everything that can be invented has been? This is reportedly a brash statement made in 1899 by the then commissioner of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Charles H. Duell. It turns out he didn't actually say it. What about this quote? There's no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. Supposedly this was uttered by Ken Olson, the founder and CEO of Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977. Well, this wasn't actually said by Ken Olson either. Okay, what about this one? Do you really believe the moon isn't there when nobody looks? Now this one actually was said, and by Albert Einstein, no less. So, are you curious about what he was referring to? Thanks for watching Paralopedia, your source for what is, isn't, and might be true about paranormal phenomena. This is your place to balance science with faith, where we live in the gray wasteland between closed-minded skeptics and mindless believers. I'm Jason, and in the video today we are talking about the measurement problem, entanglement, and consciousness. In my last video, we talked about if ghosts were real, then they had to be made out of something. We looked at everything known to exist, from the atoms on the periodic table to the particles in the standard model. But unfortunately, there was nothing that met all the criteria for the way ghosts are said to behave. Let me start this video off by asking you this. Have you ever thought about your place in the universe? Or better yet, your relationship to it? If you think about it, you really are the universe's realization of itself. It might sound weird, but we are a very small part in a very large system that are aware that they are a very small part in a very large system. Think of it like this. It would be like a microorganism in your body, gaining awareness and realizing what they were, and what you are, and that they were a part of you. We are a part of the universe. We can't separate ourselves from it. We are made of the same atomic elements on the same periodic table as anything else in the universe, whether it be our sun or a distant galaxy. The only difference being the actual elements used and the amount of those elements. There's no special element that humans have that our sun or distant galaxies don't. Well, except for one thing, and that thing is consciousness. Okay, so we have consciousness. Is that really that big of a deal? Well, it appears it might be. It might be the most important thing in the universe. It looks like it might be what makes the universe behave the way it does. Have you ever played peekaboo with the baby? Many times they find this game funny. Cover your face and they think you've disappeared. Uncover it and they think you've magically popped back into existence from nothing. It doesn't take long before we gain the ability called object permanence. Object permanence is the understanding that objects continue to exist even when they cannot be observed, meaning when they can't be seen, heard, touched, smelled, or sensed in any way. As real as this idea seems to people in everyday life, object permanence might actually be an illusion. Physics World is the membership magazine of the Institute of Physics. In 2002, they took a poll and according to its readers, the most beautiful experiment in physics was what is known as the double slit experiment. This experiment was first performed by Thomas Young in 1801. Later on in 1927, a different version of this was performed by Clinton Davison and Lester Gurman. It has been even further refined today and it shows us some very weird and unexpected aspects about the world around us. Many of you know about this, but for those that don't, the experiment goes like this. If you have a source of light shining against a board with two slits, like a light bulb, it will come out of the two slits and on the wall behind it there will be what is known as an interference pattern. If waves or water or sound were forced through the two slits, they would behave in the same way. This is how waves act. It's caused by the two waves interfering with one another. Where a wave's crest meets another's trough, they will cancel each other out and make a dark spot. And where two crests meet, they will intensify and there will be a light spot. Now let's do this experiment again, only this time we'll see what particles do. Particles act like bullets out of a gun. They'll keep going straight forward until they're stopped by something. So if you fire a large group of particles through one slit, you get a single line of intensity on the other side corresponding to the open slit. Now if you keep shooting particles, not waves, at two open slits, something weird and unexpected happens. Instead of getting two bands of intensity like you might expect from a particle, you get another interference pattern. Okay, well that can be explained. What must be happening is as the particles are going through, they must be somehow bouncing off one another, causing the interference pattern to appear. When scientists first saw this result, they didn't know quite what to think. 
but they are very clever. So what they decided to do was send one particle at a time through. That way they would ensure that each individual particle would go through one slit or the other without having anything interfere with it at all. So you would expect there should be two bands of light when they did this, right? You would if you were using common sense or object permanence. But real world common sense, nor object permanence, applies to this experiment. What you actually get is this, another interference pattern. Scientists didn't know how this was occurring, but again they were very clever, so what they decided to do was put a detector by the top slit. If the particle went through the top slit, the detector would beep. If it didn't, the detector wouldn't beep, letting them know it had gone through the bottom slit. Doing the experiment the exact same way this time, the only difference being the addition of a detector. They should get the same interference pattern they got with no detector, and be able to tell which slit the particle had gone through. So what do you think they got? This is the creepy part. They got two bands like they were expecting to get the first time they had used the detector. This completely baffled them. What was going on? Someone eventually had the idea, hey, let's leave the detector there, only let's turn it off. Same exact experiment as the time before when they were watching. Last time they had gotten two bands, but this time, when the particles weren't being watched, they went back to acting like waves, and they got another interference pattern. They eventually concluded that just the act of watching the particle changed the way it acted. This wasn't a one-time thing, but it has happened every time they have done this experiment. But this begs the question, how does a particle, a bit of matter so small it can't even be seen through the most powerful microscope on the planet, know that it's being watched? You might find this answer surprising, but scientists have no idea, even though they have been studying this problem for a very long time. The only thing that changes in this experiment is the addition or subtraction of a measuring device, or that is to say, a conscious observer. You can easily find videos of this experiment all over YouTube. It is the most beautiful after all, but I'll leave a link to the Royal Institution's video in the description below. Here's an excerpt from it. But of course I've been cheeky here. I haven't shown you the results of the experiment. That's what you get. 50% of the time it beeps and you see a spot arrive adjacent to the upper slit. The other half of the time it doesn't beep but you see a spot arrive at the lower slit. So, yeah, it's picked out the atoms that have gone through the upper slit and not the ones that have gone through. So each atom does go through one slit or the other. But that's a different result to what we had earlier. Leave the detector there, but just very quietly go and unplug it. <laughs> Don't let the atoms know that you're not spying on them. Make them think that you're still detecting them. So, yeah, 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 okay, we're gonna run the experiment. Atoms, okay, get ready, one at a time. We're gonna be checking on you. All right, so, run the experiment again. <laughs> now, if you can explain this using common sense and logic, <laughs> do let me know, because there's a Nobel Prize for you. This is what is known as the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics isn't like any other science in the world. Nobody can tell you where any particular particle is at any moment in time. They can only give you a probability of where it will be at any point in time. As weird as this might sound, the reason why you can't know where any certain particle is at any moment in time, with complete certainty, is it doesn't actually exist in one place until a conscious observer measures it. Until it is looked at, the particle is in the state known as superposition, meaning it is quite literally in several places at the same time. What is actually happening when the one particle is going towards the two slits is it is going through both slits at the same time and it is interfering with itself. If this isn't weird or creepy enough for you, listen to the latest version of this experiment they have done. In recent years, technology has allowed scientists to perform a fascinating variation of the test. Its results call into question our perception of time itself. This is like a high-tech version of the double hole experiment. Electrons are being fired toward a barrier with two holes in it. But the scientists can delay their decision about whether to observe the electrons until after they've passed through the holes, but before they hit the screen. At that moment, the electrons, in essence, become particles, and seemingly always were particles from the time they left the electron gun. So it's as though they went back in time to before they went through the holes and decided to go through one or the other. 
not through both as they would have had they been behaving like waves. That's really crazy. That's the enigma. That our choice of what experiment to do determines the prior state of the electron. Somehow or other, we've had an influence on it which appears to travel backwards in time. This fundamental part of quantum mechanics is what prompted Albert Einstein's famous quote, do you really believe the moon isn't there when nobody looks? I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Even if this experiment didn't exist, we would know that consciousness was a very strange and unusual property in the universe, unlike anything else. But this experiment does exist, and it seems to be hinting at the fact that it might be our consciousness, not that it necessarily creates the world around us, but at least makes the world around us act the way it does. There is another part of quantum mechanics that I want to talk about before I get to my point in this video. It is another property of quantum mechanics that is just as weird and makes just as little sense as a measurement problem, and that is entanglement. Albert Einstein is best known for his theory of relativity. With relativity, Einstein added to Isaac Newton's law of gravity, explaining things that Newton couldn't in his time. One of the things that relativity says is that nothing in the universe can go faster than light. Even getting to the speed of light is impossible for objects with mass. The theory says that objects with mass gain mass as they speed up, and that speeding up requires energy. The more mass, the more energy is required. By the time an object reaches the speed of light, Einstein calculated its mass would be infinite, and so would the amount of energy required to increase its speed. This means nothing can get up to the speed of light if it has mass. Photons do move the speed of light, but that's because photons have zero mass. Relativity has been proven correct time and time again, so scientists don't think it's wrong. But the speed of light being the cosmic speed limit is what makes entanglement so strange. If two particles are created together, they're in a state known as entanglement. Basically, this is how entanglement works. If something happens to one of these particles, then the same thing happens to the other particle it's entangled with. This experiment has been done with entangled particles over a mile away from each other here on Earth. This might not seem all that weird, but this interaction doesn't happen near the speed of light, or even at the speed of light, but instantaneously. And it doesn't matter if these particles are miles apart or on opposite sides of the universe. It will still be instantaneous. Einstein called entanglement spooky action at a distance, so entanglement can mean only one of two things. Either the information between the two particles is somehow gained from one point to the other instantaneously, which many in science question because it contradicts relativity, something they know has proven itself to be correct time and time again. Or somehow, in some way we can't see, the particles are still connected to each other. But how could they be connected if they're on opposite sides of the universe? Nobody knows for sure, but it might be similar to looking at someone in their bed, with their feet and their head sticking out from the covers. If you look at them, you'll automatically know they have a body that connects the two seemingly separate parts, the head and the feet. But what if you didn't know that? What if the blanket, bed, and room itself are all invisible, and all you could see were the head and the feet? Entanglement hints at the idea that reality, or at least the reality we believe ourselves to be observing every day, isn't really what's going on. Some even think that the particles in the universe might have been entangled at the moment of the Big Bang. If that's true, that means everything in the universe is somehow still touching and sharing information on some level we can't understand. If we really are in some way connected to the universe as a whole, this could possibly explain things like psychics, prophecies, telekinetic powers, and even people who are said to be empaths. Now, I don't necessarily believe any of this, but nobody knows for sure. The law of conservation of energy in physics states that the total energy in the isolated system remains constant and conserved over time. In other words, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. So what is consciousness? Is it energy or mass? Nothing in the universe has zero energy and zero mass. Remember, the photon doesn't have mass, which is why it moves at the speed of light, but it does have plenty of energy. So since whatever consciousness is has to have energy, mass, or both like everything else in the universe, what does it change into when we die? Scientists have argued for a long time now about what consciousness is, and there's no answer. Many today think it's nothing that can't be explained by neuroscience, but if consciousness is nothing more than electrical signals going through a biological brain, and there's nothing unexplainable about it, then why does it change the way particles act? Scientists don't know, and there's a good chance that they never will. But if consciousness is a fundamental part of the universe, and in some way continues after we die, one thing is for sure, we'll all know one day. David Chalmers is an Australian philosopher and cognitive scientist. He's also a university professor of philosophy and neuroscience, and a director for the Center of Mind, Brain, and Consciousness at New York University. I'm going to play a little bit of a TED talk he did. I'll put a link to the whole video in the description below. Consciousness is one of the fundamental facts of human existence. 
Each of us is conscious. We all have our own inner movie. Consciousness also is what makes life worth living. If we weren't conscious, nothing in our lives would have meaning or value. But at the same time, it's the most mysterious phenomenon in the universe. Why are we conscious? Why do we have these inner movies? Why aren't we just robots who process all this input, produce all that output, without experiencing the inner movie at all? Right now, nobody knows the answers to those questions. I'm going to suggest that to integrate consciousness into science, some radical ideas may be needed. Some people say a science of consciousness is impossible. Science, by its nature, is objective. Consciousness, by its nature, is subjective. So there can never be a science of consciousness. Now, I'm a scientific materialist at heart. I want a scientific theory of consciousness that works. And for a long time, I banged my head against the wall, looking for a theory of consciousness in purely physical terms that would work. But I eventually came to the conclusion that that just didn't work for systematic reasons. It's a long story, but the core idea is just that what you get from purely reductionist explanations in physical terms, in brain-based terms, is stories about the functioning of a system, its structure, its dynamics, the behavior it produces. Great for solving the easy problems, how we behave, how we function. But when it comes to subjective experience, why does all this feel like something from the inside? That's something fundamentally new, and it's always a further question. We've got this wonderful, great chain of explanation. We're used to it, where physics explains chemistry. Chemistry explains biology. Biology explains parts of psychology. But consciousness doesn't seem to fit into this picture. On the one hand, it's a datum that we're conscious. On the other hand, we don't know how to accommodate it into our scientific view of the world. So I think consciousness right now is a kind of anomaly, one that we need to integrate into our view of the world, but we don't yet see how. Faced with an anomaly like this, radical ideas may be needed. I think that we may need one or two ideas that initially seem crazy before we can come to grips with consciousness, scientifically. The first crazy idea is that consciousness is fundamental. Physicists sometimes take some aspects of the universe as fundamental building blocks, space and time and mass. They postulate fundamental laws governing them. If you can't explain consciousness in terms of the existing fundamentals, space, time, mass, charge, then as a matter of logic, you need to expand the list. The natural thing to do is to postulate consciousness itself as something fundamental a fundamental building block of nature. Maybe consciousness is an unknown part of the universe, like David said. Maybe consciousness dictates what the universe does, like the measurement problem might be showing us. Maybe entanglement is what sometimes binds a consciousness here after the body has died. Maybe ghosts are the entangled manifestation of a consciousness that once lived, but are now hidden away from the living world by a giant sheet separating their world from ours. Maybe ghosts can't be made out of anything in the physical world. Maybe ghosts can only be experienced by another conscious observer, and they aren't made out of anything at all. Maybe for some reason we aren't supposed to be able to figure out what ghosts are made out of. We can't explain what ghosts are in any scientific way. For those that believe in ghosts and life after death, does that really matter? A scientist will tell you that ghosts are nothing more than superstition, and you can't prove they are real. This is very true, but in the same way you can't prove they are real, they also can't prove they're not. If you see a ghost and nobody believes you, don't worry too much. That person that doesn't believe you might see a ghost one day themselves, and that will more than likely be all the convincing they need. If you think I'm wrong, leave me a comment below and let me know what you think. Take care, and thanks for watching.